recording started and uh, okay so last time we were discussing uh, high dimensional integration uh, uh, with uh, with so-called um, uh, Vegas algorithm uh, and we assigned the homework that you have to finish until Wednesday. Uh, but today we are gonna switch to a slightly different uh, uh, type of problems, uh, which are still related to uh, random numbers, but uh, they are kind of more uh, uh, commonly called uh, Monte Carlo uh, important sampling. It's of course very related to what we were discussing up to now. Uh, so uh, what is uh, important sampling? Um, so we are gonna discuss uh, mostly classical uh, many particle system uh, like Ising model, but I will also introduce from time to time uh, a little bit of concepts of how would this be applied to quantum mechanics. Uh, so if you don't know enough about quantum mechanics, don't get scared, it's okay. You don't need to understand quantum mechanics to, to follow this lecture, but those of you who understand quantum mechanics might, uh, 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 might uh, pick up some ideas of how to apply this to quantum problems. So there are actually two basic things that we will discuss in this lecture. And later on, uh, I plan to also present the third one. Uh, basically, the first is the uh, uh, simulation of uh, classical or quantum problems uh, with uh, Monte Carlo. The second one is simulated annealing, which is a way of finding a global minimum uh, of um, of uh, uh, many dimensional functions. And then the final one is integration. So just like we did integration uh, with um, simple Monte Carlo uh, uh, in previous lecture, uh, and then later on with Vegas, we can do integration also with Markov's chain. Uh, now, the, um, when we do simulation, so the first case, the simulation is performed by random walk through very large configuration space. So of course, we always have a problem of very large configuration space, otherwise the, the problem is trivial. Uh, the probability to make a move has to be such that the system gets to thermal equilibrium and remains in thermal equilibrium at certain temperature T, which is usually a parameter after a lot of Monte Carlo steps. So this simulation, of course, has to do with simulating physical systems Then we assign temperature T. Now, in some problems which are not physical systems, uh, we still try to find something that would be equivalent to temperature, okay? Just to kind of artificially invent uh, a parameter that would respond to temperature. Um, but in, of course, when we simulate physical systems, temperature is always quantity. Uh, so this is a simulation. Now, simulated annealing is, um, is a problem of uh, finding let me mute. Uh, a second. Somebody is uh, not muted, and it's. Uh, I see some sound. Okay, it's gone. Okay, so um, simulated annealing is basically finding global minimum of a function which is very high dimensional function. So you, probably you know that mathematically finding a global minimum of a very high dimensional function is NP complex problem, which means that it needs exponential uh, uh, amount of time to find the solution. So this, these are so-called unsolved problems or so NP complex problems. Uh, but in practice, simulated annealing is a good solution. Simulated annealing is not an exact solution. So it's not something that solved an NP complex problem. But for practical purposes, if we do this simulations for long enough and we change the temperature slowly enough, we are guaranteed to get a very, very, very good solution to this uh, global minimization problem. So this was invented actually uh, during, the, uh, during the Second World War when physicists were working on the uh, nuclear bomb. 
and they uh, were needed to do some uh, some immunization. And at that time, Metropolis uh, invented the simulated annealing. Uh, the, so the idea is very simple. So we need to um, we need to find um, some way of simulating the system. Uh, we kind of map the system to some something like a physical system that has a temperature, and then we slow, slowly decrease the temperature of the system, and we know that by slowly decreasing the temperature of the system uh, sufficiently slowly, we are guaranteed to get to the ground state. Okay, so that's what we know from uh, from basic thermodynamics. So now, if we uh, uh, when we're using this type of cooling down by Monte Carlo, one can find the global minimum of a general minimization problem. If we, of course, make this um, this uh, change of the temperature sufficiently uh, sufficiently uh, slowly, okay. So um, we, we will uh, discuss this problem with so-called um, uh, traveling salesman problem. I guess you probably heard of traveling salesman problem. So they, the uh, the problem is that you, uh, we have a traveling salesman that has uh, n cities and wants to um, visit all n cities, and it can be large, thousands. Uh, needs to uh, visit all n cities uh, in the shortest possible path. Okay, so he needs to start with any city and needs to see all visit all the cities in shortest shortest possible path so that to uh, to uh, make the uh, exp the smallest possible expense in terms of uh, gasoline for example uh, and uh, and of course this is an np complex problem we need to uh, find a way uh, of mapping this problem to a physical problem that has some temperature and then we can apply physical intuition that when you change, slowly change the temperature, you will eventually get to the to the ground state. And finally, we can also integrate a, a general a function uh, which has high dimensions uh, with Markov chain. Uh, this might not be so obvious at this moment uh, how this is related to Markov chain, but I will try to explain this um, uh, by the end of this chapter on uh, Monte Carlo. Uh, how to apply Marcos chain for the integration that we were doing before with Vegas algorithm and with uh, with Naim Monte Carlo. Okay, so uh, uh, let's first discuss Monte Carlo important sampling with Marco chain. So uh, let let us introduce the concept of Marco chain. What's essential to know about Marcos chain? Uh, so in, in this uh, chapter, we are going to discuss. Um, configuration X all the time. So let's say if configuration in phase space is denoted by X, the probability for configuration according to Boltzmann is this quantity, doesn't it? So Boltzmann distribution is something that you, you uh, 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 of course, learned probably in high school, but definitely in undergrad uh, physics course. Um, uh, and uh, here beta is the inverse temperature. The question is, of course, what is the configuration? So how do you, how do you understand configuration in my problem? Uh, well, in physics problem, that's uh, kind of obvious. I'm going to uh, show you uh, Ising model. Okay, you probably are familiar with Ising model, isn't it? Uh, so the Ising model is uh, uh, is basically a, a in two dimensions is a square lattice problem. So we have a lattice here of n by n. In this case, we have 256 by 256 uh, points. And on each lattice side, we have a spin that can be either uh, plus or minus. Uh, in this case means a black dot or a white dot. Uh, and uh, basically there is some function which gives you, uh, which gives you energy of the system. So usually uh, we uh, simulate so-called nearest neighbor Ising model with, in which energy of total energy of system is basically one half sum over all possible uh, neighbors ij, uh, jij, spin si, spin sj. So this si can be either uh, plus one or minus one. So each spin can be either plus one or minus one. Uh, basically black or white, uh, then 
if the two spins are oriented in the same way, um, you uh, probably missed, uh, missed a minus sign here if you want to have a ferromagnetic one. So if the two spins are uh, oriented in the same way, then we have some negative contribution to the, to the total energy. If they're, uh, if they're in the opposite way, then we have a positive contribution to the total energy. And when we simulate this thing, uh, after a long time, we uh, go into a uh, uh, ferromagnetic configuration after a long time. So this is what this thing uh, uh, shows you. And um, we can run it, for example, like this, start. So I think uh, we are close to the phase transition now. So a temperature 2.6, I think, is a phase transition of the uh, Ising model. So about this tem particular temperature 2.6, uh, Ising model uh, is completely disordered. Uh, below this temperature, it's partially ordered, and a zero temperature is completely ordered. So all the spins uh, uh, in the ground state, all the spins point in, point in the same direction. Does that? And in the ground state, all the spins have to point in the same configuration, same direction. Uh, at very high temperature, uh, the probability for any spin to point up or down is equal. Um, and uh, in between, there is a particular temperature at which the phase transition happens, and this phase transition is of the uh, of the second order, isn't that it? it's continuous? Um, now, what is the configuration? So the reason that I started discussing the Eisen model is because I wanted to explain you what configuration X in our discussion is. So configuration X is um, is 256 and 256 bits. Okay. So each each um, uh, bit here or each um, uh, 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 each um, dot uh, in the screen uh, is either black or white and all these dots together uh, are one configuration x okay so in this case it's 256 and 256 uh, zeros or ones basically uh, 256 and 256 bits this is configuration x isn't it and once we have a configuration like that we have this 256 to 256 numbers, then we can evaluate, uh, we can evaluate this total energy. We can, we can just give uh, uh, to total energy, we can give this uh, expression and you can calculate what total energy is for that particular configuration. Once you have a total energy E, then temperature is external parameter. You can calculate what should be probability for that configuration at this particular temperature, isn't it? Once you know that, then basically you can start simulating the system. Okay, but this is, is essential to explain what configuration you have in mind. Now, I was discussing before simulated annealing at the beginning, and I said, well, simulated annealing is something that will uh, allow you to find uh, to find uh, uh, global minimum if you change temperature sufficiently slowly. So let me see if my fingers can change temperature sufficiently slowly to find ground state of the system. Okay, so let me try to do that. So now we are at 2.6, 2.6. Actually, the, uh, the critical temperature is at 2.26. So I guess I should go above the critical temperature. So to have a completely random uh, uh, configuration. So now at temperature seven, it, this is a very, very high temperature. You see that all uh, configurations are equally probable or all spin directions are equally probable on each side. And now I'm supposed to change the temperature sufficiently slowly. And if I do that, I'm supposed to be, well, I'm guaranteed to get to the ground state. And well, kind of my fingers are not good enough. Because look, if I'm changing it like that, I am not in the ground state. So do you recognize this is not the ground state? Okay. So now I, if I go all the way down to zero, I'm frozen in this state. And this is one of the, um, uh, this has a lot of domain walls. So this, these are domains. So domain of 
positive uh, spins and domain of negative spins. And once the temperature is low enough, you're not going to get rid of these domain walls. Okay. Now in physics, we know that the domain walls also happen. So that's, uh, it's not, uh, uh, how can I say, it's not unexpected, but nevertheless, this is not the ground state yet. I mean, this simulation, the, the way it's done, I think eventually if I choose, if I, if I wait for very, 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 very long time, I might be able to get rid of those uh, domain walls and actually some of them already disappeared. But nevertheless, this, um, uh, the state, um, which I obtained by changing the temperature too quickly is very hard to, um, uh, uh, very hard to go from this to the ground state. Very, very hard. So um, what can I say is that my, my, um, my simulated annealing wasn't very efficient. Uh, so I found uh, an excited state, which is not really the ground state. So can I do better? Well, of course, I mean, I can, I can do this much, much slower. So now I'm going back. I, I could do this much, much slower. Of course, in, when I'm coding, I can figure it out to do how to do it very, very slow so that maybe I'm, uh, uh, I'm avoiding this. Uh, but the better way to do it is just to figure out um, slightly different um, uh, step, okay? So step. Uh, what I didn't discuss yet is that this, um, what is called metropolis here, is basically uh, the, the typical step that um, the algorithm is making is it selects randomly one of the spins, any spin, any spin is uh, randomly selected with exactly the same probability and it tries to flip the spin with probability that has to do with the detail balance that we're gonna to discuss today. But so the point is you select one spin and you try to flip it with, prob with probability that corresponds to this, um, uh, to this uh, temperature, okay? And uh, unfortunately, these uh, um, steps are not very efficient to uh, uh, reach the ground state. As you've seen, uh, changing it quite slowly uh, still makes trouble to get to the ground state. This is again, not a ground state. I mean, it's not, it's, it's reason, the reasonable probability to ground state in the sense that uh, um, a quite large number of, uh, of the area is black or some of them are white, but still this is not a ground state. Um, now, if I change this algorithm to so-called Wolf algorithm, you see I'm done in no time. Now everything's black, okay? I go to high temperature. Well, actually for high temperature, start, it's better to start with Metropolis. I go to Wolf and of course, Wolf uh, at very high temperature is completely inefficient, doesn't do anything. But then when I start, go, uh, come closer to the, uh, to the, yeah, now I'm below the ground, below the uh, transition temperature, I'm gonna be able to get with very, very large steps, very quickly to the ground state. Ah, ground state, no problem. Okay, and so then I guess if I go up in temperature, I think it's better to go to Metropolis. Um, and let me start close to the ground state. And now I switch on Wolf. And we see that Wolf is flipping. So what I didn't explain here is what was the difference between the, uh, the Wolf algorithm and uh, simple metropolis basically uh, the difference is that with wolf algorithm i'm flipping not one single spin but one domain so what what you need to do is you need to find the connected area in which all the spins have the same orientation so you see that now we are flipping here one black or one white domain Okay, so a region which where all the spins point in the same direction. And I decided to flip the entire domain rather than one single spin. And of course, with this way, I'm flipping the spins way, way faster in some sense because the domains are of finer size. And at least with this algorithm, I once I'm below the transition temperature, I can very, very, very quickly uh, find the ground state very easily. And actually the thermalization uh, at temperature T is way faster with this uh, with this so-called global update. So this is called global update. Um, so the, the the moral of the story is that uh, the 
the way you design your steps in your algorithm matters a lot. Uh, more sufficient, more efficient steps can uh, reduce the computational power tremendously um, when you make the steps. But both um, uh, Wolf step and Metropolis, the usual Metropolis step, um, uh, are um, they are both done with so-called um, Metropolis algorithm, so which we're going to discuss today. So the only difference is what you uh, select as a step. Okay, so now let me stop this because otherwise it uses a lot of resources. Pause. Um, so um, this was just a, a, a small intermediate so to the, uh, explain you what configuration X here means. So once more configuration X is now uh, N by N um, numbers, which are either plus one or minus, minus one. Or you can think of, think of them as zero and one doesn't matter. But in, in this, uh, if, if this is our energy, then it should be plus one or minus one. Now in uh, here, for those of you who understand quantum, quantum mechanics or they had the quantum mechanics course, then I can explain also uh, the generalization of this Boltzmann distribution function in quantum case. So in quantum, we usually take the probability uh, with respect to partition function. So while well, partition function, you understand even if you had the uh, uh, thermodynamics, thermodynamic course, um, uh, because in this case, we also discuss partition function. And actually partition function contribution in classical system is exactly e to the minus beta ex. So we do the same in quantum, except that e to the minus beta ex um, is hard to evaluate in quantum case if we have states that are not eigenstates. So if the states are eigenstates, if all the, the states in quantum mechanics are eigenstates, that, then we can use just the Boltzmann distribution, no problem. But usually the states are not eigenstates, isn't that? X is, uh, it's very hard to generate, gen, ge, uh, generate a random uh, eigenstate that such a thing is, 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 uh, is not, uh, not possible. So, but we can still generate states which are not eigenstates. And then we can uh, define, for example, um, the probability to be proportional to its contribution to the <coughs> partition function where we calculate uh, e to the minus beta h. So h here is Hamiltonian, isn't it? h is Hamiltonian. Um, beta is uh, one over temperature, so we can still calculate e to the minus beta h uh, for any any state x, which is not a ground, which is not an eigenstate, uh, and then we calculate basically the, the uh, expectation value for that. For example, that's one way. Uh, so we, we calculate expectation value of the partition function in this configuration x, which of course, if if x is uh, an eigenstate of the system, then this is exactly the same as e to min minus beta e x, isn't it? Okay, so that's what we usually do in, in quantum mechanics. We're going to return to this a little bit uh, later. Um, but otherwise, if you ask me what's the difference between um, uh, quantum Monte Carlo and classical Monte Carlo, so many people ask that, uh, I say that there is no difference. Okay, because uh, people call it quantum Monte Carlo, but that just means that you're apply, you're applying Monte Carlo to quantum systems. Okay, and instead of using, let's say, a classical Boltzmann distribution, you use some some generalization of that to quantum systems, and you generalize gen, gen, in, and you um, then um, simulate some quantum system. That's that's quantum Monte Carlo. Of course, there are lots of variants of quantum Monte Carlo, and maybe we're going to mention some of them at the end of this course. Now, but let, let me return back to, uh, to uh, uh, Marco Chain. So um, we can generate, we can uh, simulate a physical system uh, in two ways. One is by brute force, something that we are not going to do, of course. Uh, but in brute force, it's, it's a good idea to think of it just to contrast uh, Marco chain with brute force uh, uh, Monte Carlo. So in brute force, what we would do is you would generate a truly random configuration X and accept it with probability e to the minus beta EX 
where energy, let's say, is bigger than zero, let's say, I mean, actually, this is not essential, but let's, let's say for, for uh, simplicity. Uh, then the important point is successive configurations are statistically independent. So this is crucial, statistically independent. So in brute force Monte Carlo, we would make statistically independent configuration configurations, and we would, uh, we would uh, accept them with this probability according to Boltzmann. So what does it mean statistically independent configuration? Well, in, in the case of Ising model that we have it here, it means that you will need, to, we will need n by n, which is 256 and 256 random numbers, or at least random bits, okay? So uh, 256 to 256 random orientations of the spins. So that's expensive because we need lots of random numbers, and then once we have these lots of new random numbers, uh, you would need to we would need to recalculate the total energy uh, with this uh, with this expression here, and that itself is also expensive. I mean, it's possible to do that, of course, but it's uh, quite an expensive thing, and uh, then you're not going to be able to generate many um, uh, many um, configurations uh, in uh, I don't know, sufficient uh, in, in small uh, amount of time. So this is very, very inefficient. Now, what we, of course, always do is uh, something that we call Markov chain, which means that successive configurations, Xi and Xi plus one, are not statistically independent. They're actually very, very, very statistically dependent. There is a very small difference between the two, sometimes no difference, sometimes a tiny difference between the two, OK? So um, therefore, it, because the difference between the two successive configurations is very small, one can um, invent steps which are very efficient, way more than uh, than uh, if you if you uh, need to generate completely statistically independent uh, new configuration. Now the, the issue is that these uh, configurations are not statistically independent. But uh, they are still uh, distributed according to chosen distributions, such as Boston distribution. So it turns out that if we are uh, careful enough generating Markov chain, uh, uh, then we can simulate equally efficiently physical system with this Markov chain instead of the brute, with the brute force. So Markov chain will give you all the information that the brute force uh, Monte Carlo will give you. But uh, of course, when we uh, calculate the error bars, for example, we need, to, we need to make sure that we understand that successive configurations are statistically dependent, we're very dependent. So basically, when we calculate, for example, standard deviation, uh, we should not uh, say that uh, successive configurations are, are, are statistically independent because this would give you way too small error bar. We need to, we need to go very, very far away in Markov chain between successive steps, uh, then we can call them statistically, more or less statistically independent. So what is then the difference between Markov chain and uncorrected sequence? Um, well, it, mathematically, we, we explained it now physically. So one means we have a completely independent um, uh, configurations. And in the other case, we have, uh, uh, we have steps to go from creation one to creation two. So now uh, when we um, uh, talk about equations, we can say that for truly random or uncorrelated sequence of configurations, they satisfy the following constraint, that probability that we have configuration X1, then after that X2 and so on, and we end with Xn is equal to the product uh, uh, of probability that we have X1 probability to have X2 to probability to have X, Xn. And why is that? Because the configurations are statistically independent. So therefore the, um, the probability for all of those um, uh, configurations to follow a certain sequence is just a product of, of probability to have each of them, okay? So basically the, this is a trivial thing in statistics that if the configurations are completely independent, then the, prod, the, pro, the, the uh, uh, total probability is just the product of independent probabilities, okay? 
Now, Markov chain is a completely different story. In Markov chain, the probability for uh, for sequence of uh, uh, of um, states x1, x2, xn. This is actually should be xn, not bxn. So this is xn. Oops. So xn. So probability for 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 those xn is equal to probability that we have the first configuration times transition probability from first con configuration to the second configuration times transition probability for second to the third and so on and so forth times transition probability from xn minus one to xn so what we introduce here is something that we call transition probability uh, transition probability is related to the step that we take so in this simulation that i showed you uh, for the ising model the step would be flip a spin or would be flip a domain okay so these are steps so and every time we talk about the transition probability split a spin or flip a domain we need to decide we need to talk about transition probability from configuration x to configuration x prime so the two configurations um, how to go from one configuration to another and this um, uh, transition probability satisfy this uh, um, um, some rule that if we sum over all end probabilities we get one which is kind of obvious so if we sum over all possible uh, uh, configurations that the system can end up then the probability has to be one because we need to end up in one of the possible states so if we sum over all possible configurations at the end into or all transition probabilities into which state we can go well we we're definitely going to go into one of those states so therefore probability has to be one doesn't it so the idea is that we want to generate markov chain where distribution of, the, of states is proportional to the chosen distribution e to the minus beta ex and the distribution of states is independent of the position within the chain and independent of the initial configuration Okay, so think about this. So we need to, our distribution has to be proportional to the Boltzmann and it has to be independent of the initial configuration. So why is that the case? Independent of initial configuration. Well, typically we start with some initial configuration which is um, either truly random or something that you come up with with some physical intuition we could just start start with all spins pointing up which is like the ground state or we can start with something completely random in both cases uh none of those states uh, is is actually highly probable at certain temperature t so if we want to um uh, if you want to have a more uh, monte carlo if you want to have a marco chain that corresponds to certain temperature t then you have to forget about this initial state because this initial state does not correspond to a typical state at this temperature isn't it it's very unlikely that this temperature that you kind of come up with with which you start uh, is probable in at this temperature that you're simulating so for example uh, if you uh, simulate something um, close to the uh, close to the random state uh, close to the ground state then uh, selecting completely random configuration is very very unlikely is that if you select very, uh, completely random configuration it's extremely unlikely of course if you simulate the ground state and you start with the ground state this is a good configuration then you don't need uh, 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 warm-up time but that's unlikely i mean usually we don't know the state that we are trying to simulate so um, the point is that typically when you start with some random uh, uh, initial configuration, we need to throw away sufficient number of initial steps before we start uh, uh, our statistical uh, analysis. Okay, uh, and it turns out also the distribution of the states within the Markov chain has to be uh, has to be independent. So no no matter where you look at the in in the Markov chain, they all need to be distributed according to this distribution and it should be independent of where we looked at it. So in the typical uh, Markov chain should satisfy that. Okay, so um, 
Now, in order to generate the barcode chain, we need to have two uh, conditions met. One is so-called connectness, and the other one is so-called data balance. And I'm going to try to explain explain both concepts to you. But before I do that, is there any question? Any question with these concepts? No? Simple enough? OK, so then let me explain what connectness means. So the necessary condition for generating such Marco chain is that every configuration in the phase space should be accessible from any other configuration with finite number of steps. OK, this is called connectness or irreducibility. So um, this is something that we always need to be careful about. In, in simple problems, of course, um, uh, this is kind of um, very uh, trivial and we, we forget about it. But when you have non-trivial problem, you always need to check this. Um, every configuration has to be accessible with our algorithm, with our steps that we have. So we, of course, this connectness depends on the steps that we chose, choose, OK? So uh, you have a, we have our Eisen model here, Eisen model. And we ask ourselves what, well, uh, configuration is, of course, any distribution of spins, OK? So if we choose a step to be single spin flip, so random, you choose a, run, you, you choose a spin randomly in this lattice, and you flip it. The question is, will you reach any possible configuration with this algorithm? What do you think? Is the answer yes or no? Will I reach any possible configuration for the Ising model by flipping single spin at a time? And of course, this needs to be reached with finite number of steps. It can be large number, but finite number of steps. Well, the answer should be obvious. Of course, I can do that, doesn't it? Of course, I can do that because I am allowed to flip every spin, which is I'm allowed to flip 256 times 256 spins. So every single spin I can flip. And of course, I can get from any state to any state. Obvious, trivial, isn't it? If I'm allowed to flip any spin. So I'm guaranteed that with 256 and 256 spin flips, I will definitely reach any configuration. OK? So therefore, connectness is kind of obvious in this case. Now, what about the um, uh, Wolf algorithm? So this one, the second one that we were doing. So remember, we were uh, we were we were flipping. Uh, let me use the temperature a little bit. So we were flipping here the entire domain. So here it's slightly less trivial to see that every configuration can be reached, but still it's easy to well, it's kind of re easy to recognize. Uh, basically. Um, Yeah, actually, it's less trivial to see. Actually, no, it's not true. If you, if we have, if I think if we have only, if we flip only uh, uh, domains, then I don't think I'm, we are we are guaranteed to get from any configuration to any configuration. We need to have some local flips as well, as far as I remember. But uh, the point is that in many cases, in many situations, it's not completely trivial to see whether the space is connected, whether you have guarantee of ergod this is called ergodicity. Some people call it ergodicity. So the question is whether the space is connected with this particular step or whether the system is ergodic. And uh, now that I think of it, I'm not so sure if the, sim the flips of domains only is sufficiently ergodic. I think that in this Wolf algorithm, you have to mix uh, with uh, the flips of domains, also uh, uh, some uh, simple Monte Carlo steps in which you just flip one spin only. I think we have to mix the two in order to uh, guarantee the record, the ergodicity. But the point is that um, sometimes, if one algorithm uh, does not guarantee your ergodicity, you might or connectness, you might just add another step. And if with the combination of two steps, 
you have this connectness uh, satisfied, then uh, the the connectness is fine. Okay, the, this uh, uh, this uh, requirement is met. Now, how do we prove or disprove connectness? Well, mathematically, it's of course not that easy, but the way we usually do it is that we think of two configurations, let's call it XA and XB. So let's say I have configuration XA and I have correction XB. And then we ask ourselves, can we reach these two configurations with our steps that we designed, okay? And usually we prove this with a counterexample. So if you find a count, if you found, find two states, XA and XB, which uh, are uh, any two states, which maybe are very um, different, okay? You, 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 you think of very different two states. And then you think of all possible steps that you're making. And if you can prove that with this set of steps that are allowed, you cannot go from state A to state B, then you have proven that the space is not connected. In other words, that the system is not, that the simulation is not ergodic. So you, we usually prove this connectness with counterexample. So if you find a counterexample of two configurations A and B, which cannot be reached by your current steps, then you have proven that the space is not connected and we need to fix that. So either we add another step or we change the steps in such a way that connectness is guaranteed. Because if connectness is not guaranteed, then of course we are not simulating the entire phase space. We are simulating over part of the phase space and of course we are not gonna get correct, correct result. So this is important, connectness. And then the second thing that needs to be satisfied is the detail balance. Now this one I'm sure you, you heard about many times. So um, what's the idea? The idea is that we need to find a transition probability for, from any state X to any other state X prime, which leads to a given stationary distribution row of X. In this case, we think of it as Boltzmann distribution. So um, to, to uh, get to detail balance, we're gonna, just gonna derive uh, the change of transition probability when you do one step, which basically it's equivalent to, uh, uh, to uh, writing down uh, uh, differential equations. So the probability uh, for X will decrease if the system goes from X to any other X prime. So if we, if we make a step in which we go from X to any, to any other X prime, which is not equal to X, then uh, the probability for, for this configuration X will decrease. Well, how much will decrease? Well, that's kind of obvious statement here. Let me explain it. So if we originally, we, will, we were in, in, in uh, configuration X, then our probabilities will be rho of X. And then we made a step to go from X to another configuration X prime, which is different than X. So we sum over all our probably prob X primes. Then this is the change of the probability for rho of X, okay? So in other words, we were in, in, in configuration X at the beginning and we moved out of a configuration X into configuration X prime. Then our probability for configuration X has been reduced, doesn't it? So this is how much it gets reduced. But uh, we also have a process in which we, we visit configuration X from some other state. So now the probability for X can also be increased if we are before in some other configuration X prime, which is not equal to X. And then we transition from X prime to X. Okay, that's kind of obvious. So then for, therefore, if you ask me, what is the change of the probability in one step? So between T1, T plus one and T, so what's the change of the probability? Well, the change of probability is, um, is exactly this sum of these two terms. So you can the probability can be decreased if originally we were in trans, in, in configuration X and we transition from X to X prime. This was the, the negative contribution. And the positive contribution is before we were some other configuration X prime, and then we go from X prime to X. Okay. So now of course 
uh, here I, I always said uh, that um, that uh, x prime does should not be equal to x, but uh, now I can because I have two terms uh, that are that have opposite sign. I can easily allow x prime to go over x as well because then the two terms will exactly cancel when x prime is equal to x. Because the transition probability from x to x, of course, is finite, so um, uh, the, the 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 term where x prime is equal to x is also non-zero, but um, it will subtract. So here, this sum over x prime is unrestricted. So um, what we said is that the we are then we are looking for stationary solution of this equation. So why stationary solution? Because before I said we need to generate Markov chain in such a way the distribution of states is independent of the position within the chain. Okay. So if distribution is independent of the position within the chain, we need to have that this distribution does not change in time, isn't it? Distribution has to be time independent. Okay, so we need to make sure that this chain, this thing is zero, shouldn't change in time, should be equal everywhere. Okay, and it should be distributed in this way that we just discussed. So, in other words, we are looking for uh, for the condition where where this uh, first and the second term are equal. That's not so. We need to have this so-called detail balance uh, satisfied. Then the probability uh, for any configuration uh, in this Markov chain will be Bolts Boltzmann and will be independent of the position in the chain. Now the general solution of this uh, equation is actually quite non-trivial, and we almost never uh, look at it. But we can find we could, it's easily easy to find a particular solution, which is the one where we remove x prime sum over x prime, okay? So we can say that, let's say that for each x and x prime, this thing is gonna be satisfied. And if it's satisfied for each x and x prime, then it's also satisfied for the sum, okay? So basically this, of course, is way more restrictive than that, but it's good enough. So we find one particular solution, which is this, then the, this solution, of course, satisfies also the more general equation, but this is easy to simulate, so we're going to use that. Okay, so we always use the simple form, which is that between two configurations, x and x prime, we need to have this satisfied. And we call this detailed balance solution. It's one solution, it's a particular solution for the detailed balance condition. So this is called details balance condition, and this is a particular solution of the details balance condition. Not the most general one, but the simple one. Okay, so uh, now we understand everything. We need to go closer to a algorithm. Is there any question? Any question about this concept? Detail balance, connectness is obvious. Okay. Well, you can, of course, ask the question at the end of, the, of this lecture. Uh, it's fine with me. Um, uh, I don't see the time today, 5.49, okay. Uh, so, um, yeah, to, cons to construct algorithm, uh, we will define, we will split probability into two pieces. So the transition probability to go from x to x prime can be split into two pieces. Why do we do that? Well, for convenience, because the step usually uh, consists of two things. One is the trial step and the acceptance step. So the trial step has to do with the fact what is, um, what kind of step are we designing, okay? What kind of step do we gonna try? Therefore, we call it trial step, okay? So the trial step, and then 
we're going to accept the step with certain probability, which is called acceptance step. So this is acceptance part, this is trial part. So uh, the trial step probability is, um, what's the probability that we're going to try to go from X to X prime? Okay, so if this probability is symmetric, then we just can forget about it. You will see how it cancels out of the equation. Um, now, but conceptually, it's important to understand what is the trial step probability. So if we have our Ising model, going back to Ising model, if we have the sizing model, and if we simulate metropolis, this one, okay? So what is, uh, what is the trial step probability for each step x to x prime? Can somebody tell me? So it has nothing to do with temperature, it has nothing to do with the uh, Boltzmann. It's just, uh, you know the algorithm, which is that you're gonna select a single spin and we're gonna try to flip it, okay? So what is then the probability that we are going to go from any any state x to some other state x prime. What's the trial step probability? What's the probability that we're going to go from step one to step two, the, the, to, to, from configuration one to configuration two? Okay, so let me give you the answer, and you will see it's obvious. Probability transition probability from state x to x prime is equal to one over the number of spins in the system if the two configurations differ by a single spin flip, okay? So if two configurations differ for more than a single spin flip, then transition probability in one spin flip is zero. That's obvious, isn't it? Okay? But if the two configurations differ by exactly one spin flip, then the transition probability is one over the number of all the spins or one over a number of lattice sites. Why? Because we said that we're gonna choose one of those, doesn't that? So what's the probability to choose each of them? Well, one over the number of sites, doesn't that? That's the probability that we're gonna select each of them. So now think of it, is this probability symmetric? Is it symmetric? So the question is whether, um, whether the probability to go from, from configuration X to X prime is the same as going from configuration X prime to X. And I'm, I wanna argue that this is, the probability is indeed symmetric. The strange probability is symmetric. Why? Because if the two uh, configurations differ by single spin flip, then, well, if X differs from X prime from, from single spin flip, then X prime differs from X by single spin flip, isn't it? And then the probability from going to X to X prime is exactly one over number of sites, then the opposite is also true. It's also one over number of sites, isn't it? So in other words, the transition probability in this case of this trivial step is symmetric and we can forget about it. Now, now that you understand the transition probability for the for this uh, Metropolis update, what about the Wolf update? So, this this type of update. So, what's the transition probability from to going from one configuration to another? Can somebody explain me? Any idea? Why is it so quiet today? Oh, is it the error of domain wall that you flip uh, divided by the total area? Just my guess. I don't know if it's correct or not. <laughs> yeah, you're thinking too much physics here. Uh, it has nothing to do with the area of the domain wall. Uh, basically, the acceptance step probability will have to do with area of the domain wall because it has to do with energy. But we are not calculating oh. the energy. So the question is, well, maybe this, the question is not too good some, somehow. I, I had in mind a completely trivial uh, algorithm. 
you have to select one of the domain walls. Okay. And you either, you either, well, you try to flip it. So then the transition probability is basically one of the number of domain walls because you will select one of them, isn't it? And the probability to go uh, to go from from configuration x to x prime is equal to one of the number of domain walls if the two configurations differ for exactly one domain wall being flipped, isn't it? So if the two configurations differ by exactly one domain wall being flipped, then the transition probability is just one of the number of domain walls. It has nothing to do with size of the main wall or temperature or anything. But of course, that depends on the algorithm. Let's say that this is my algorithm. I'm going to look at all the, all the domains. I see the domains. OK. Uh, so let me pause it. OK. So I see this uh, black region here, the black region around here. And I say, well, I'm going to. I'm going to enumerate all the all the black and all the white regions. Let's say, and then I'm going to select one of them and flip it. So then, the probability is one of the, one of the number of domain walls. Now, of course, in practice, I don't need to do that because I know that that the probability is symmetric, and I don't even need to know how many domain walls there are. But if the probability was not symmetric, I would need to know. Okay, so. Of course, the, uh, the the this transition step probability depends on the exact algorithm which you use to select to to flip or or to 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 do you to make your move. Okay, so the I have in in mind the move in which you select one at randomly one of those domains. So all you need to do is to figure out how many domains there are, and one of the number of domains is your transition probability. Provided that the two configurations differ for exact for exactly one uh, uh, one do domain being flipped, so of course this um, transition probability is kind of not many times it's not that easy to figure out what the transition probability is. So um, and it can can be a little bit um, non-trivial to find. So um, let's say that, here, that we are doing uh, simulations that are uh, closely related to um, the integration that we were discussing uh, last time. So you remember last time we were integrating something over three-dimensional space or the, or the hypercube, you remember? Vegas algorithm and integration and so on. So let's say that our configuration now is just a vector in three-dimensional space. Okay, that's completely possible. So when we are gonna use um, metropolis for um, uh, for n-dimensional integration, we are gonna uh, use that that concept. So um, then, for example, the trial step probability uh, could be uh, going from correlation x to x prime is to have a vector x1, x2, x3 to xn. And we go to another vector, which has uh, which has um, um, uh, components x1 prime, x2 prime to xn prime. Okay. So um, let's say that uh, the that my step is such that we are, I'm just selecting at randomly one of the components. So I select one of the one out of n components of the vector. And I randomly add, oops, um, I randomly add, so it's very important that this is between minus one and one, actually. This psi in this case should be between minus one and one. I randomly add uh, here some length. I basically either add a little bit to it or remove a little bit to it. I mean, I, I add a little L or remove L. L has to be a small number, of course, shouldn't be too large. So in this case, when psi is between minus one and one, I'm guaranteed to get any vector, isn't it? So I'm, I, I start with some vector, and then I'm adding to one of the components some small L, OK? And if I do that, I'm guaranteed to get to any other vector, isn't it? 
that's not a problem. Connectedness is definitely satisfied in this case. And when I calculate the volume matrix element dv, uh, I have to do this dx1, dx2 to dxn. You remember this um, uh, uh, volume matrix element. Let's say that we are integrating. And um, in this case, uh, the trial step probability is basically symmetric. Uh, and I can forget about it. OK. Uh, why symmetric? Well, because um, uh, well, if I if the two uh, two vectors differ by one of the uh, one of the projections to be different for some uh, value l, then uh, the statement is equal equal equally valid for going from x to x prime or from x prime to x. Kind of obvious, isn't it? Uh, Okay, so I guess you understood that in Cartesian coordinates, if we're working Cartesian coordinates for hypercube, the mild trial step probability is just symmetric. Uh, and I can forget about it. Now, let me change this just a little bit, and you will see how this can get complicated. So let's say that my that I'm working in spherical coordinates. Uh, I'm doing the same process in spherical coordinates. And I start, of course, I want to generate the volume, doesn't it? And I have, rather than hypercube, I have hypersphere. And I have R, and I can go to R prime. Now, my R here. Uh, so my R was, of course, is. Uh, R times uh, what is it? How does it work? Sine theta cosine phi, R times sine theta sine phi, and R times cosine theta. Okay, you remember the spherical coordinates. Um, now, um, of course, R prime is the same. So R prime is also a function of of the length of R prime, of the theta prime and phi prime. So basically, R is a function of its length r and theta and phi, and r prime is also a function of r prime, theta prime, and phi prime, usual uh, spherical coordinates. Okay, and uh, my configuration, of course, uh, is proportional to well, the probability should be proportional to the volume. That's the function. Okay, so um, so then, uh, what is the trial step probability in this case? So let's say that my step is such that I'm generating at randomly, my R is a random number, uh, could be between zero and uh, let's say some very large R, uh, let's say R cutoff for simplicity. So eventually we need to have a cutoff, which is uh, like a large number, okay? And I am allowed to generate a random number from zero to R cutoff. Then, of course, theta is going to be a random number. All of those will be uniformly distributed. Theta is going to be from zero to pi, and phi is going to go between zero and two pi. So they're all random, uh, all uniform, uniform random numbers. And I need to generate probability which is proportional to to the volume. Volume contribution, of course. OK, so now tell me. Um, if I generate random numbers in the spherical coordinate, is the probability for to go from any r to any r prime symmetric? No. No, correct. That's correct. Why not? You have R squared in your, in your hey, volume. Absolutely. So the point is that you think of it of large R's, isn't it? What's the probability that you're going to get to a generic point at large R? Well, extremely small because, you know, the, 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 when, when, when R is growing, then of course this, um, sphere the volume the sphere it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger so the probability they're going to get 
you're going to generate a random point at very large R is very, very small, but the probability that you're going to get uh, uh, every point at small R is actually pretty big because there are not so many points at small R, doesn't it? Okay, that's great. So then what would be the probability, the, the trial step probability? Well, the trial step probability will be related to the volume matrix element, well, to the volume of the system. So what is the volume? Uh, dv is uh, is uh, uh, r square dr uh, d uh, what do we sign theta d theta is that so we are gen uh -huh, d five of course we are generating uh, dr randomly uh, uniformly we are generating theta uniformly and phi uniformly. But we still need to take care of R square and sine theta, doesn't it? So therefore, the probability for to go from x to x prime is going to be related to x to x prime. It's going to be one over R square uh, x to x prime R square sine theta uh, to go to x prime. I think it should be R prime square sine theta prime. R square sine theta. So basically, the transition probability for, to going to R to X, X to X prime has to have this R square in there. Okay. And sine theta as well. You understand? Because this, this is what contributes to the volume. Okay. Is it obvious? So the point is that uh, in spherical coordinates, you have to be very careful. You have to figure out what's the transition probability to go for a certain vector r to another vector r uh, uh, by generating uniform, let's uh, uniform certain numbers. If you are in, in uh, Cartesian coordinates, transition probability is trivial. If you are in spherical coordinates, well, you rather figure out what's the contribution to its volume. Okay, but the important point is that what I wanted to uh, make you aware of the step is that in general, the trial step probability depends on your step and it might be non-trivial. So for example, in Cartesian coordinates is simple, but in spherical coordinates might not be simple. Um, and similar for rising spins, when you flip a uh, single spin might be simple, but uh, when you do a more complicated uh, step, it might not be simple. So this was the trial step probability. Now the second, uh, 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 the second concept is acceptance step probability, which is the probability with which you accept the step. So you try to, make, to do the step, but then eventually you, you decide that you're going to accept or not accept with certain probability. So what is this acceptance step probability? Well. Uh, if I have a trial step probability, then I can determine the acceptance step probability from detailed balance. That's what I'm going to do. So I just uh, take a look at the trial step probability, this one. Okay. So I copy this rho of x times t of x to x prime uh, is equal to rho of x prime times t of x prime to x. I take this equation, cut, put it here. I replace t x to x prime with what we said. t of x to x prime can be written as a product of two things, which is uh, omega x to x prime times times uh, a uh, x x prime. Oops, x x prime, and then. Uh, the same can be done from on this side. So we I'll write this as omega x prime x times a x prime x. And then I'm solving this for uh, a uh, x x prime divided by a x prime x. And of course, I can easily do this here. So this is this would be rho of x prime times omega x prime x divided by rho of x times omega x x prime. And that's exactly what they wrote here. 
Okay, so in other words, once you know the trial step probability, uh, which you need to figure out by uh, thinking of your uh, step, then the acceptance step probability is just given by the, the uh, uh, detailed balance condition, doesn't it? This, this, this step is simple. Now, of course, you need to satisfy this detailed balance condition. Now, how do we do that? Well, um, there are different algorithms. One of them, of course, is Metropolis, if you want to discuss here. There's also heat balance, uh, uh, heat, is it heat, um, uh, heat, heat bath? Yeah, heat bath is another one, which is slightly different. But let's, let's discuss Metropolis. So in Metropolis case, we do the following. So this ratio here can stand to start, sometimes be bigger than one. If the ratio is bigger than one, you cannot accept a step with probability bigger than one, isn't it? Because that thing doesn't exist. I mean, probability bigger than one it, the concept doesn't make sense. So if this ratio is bigger than one, then we say that we always accept the step, which means the trial step probability is one. But if the ratio is smaller than one, then we accept with probability, which is equal to the ratio. That's what Mark, that's what Metropolis does. So let me repeat. So um, let's say that the, that the trial step probability is just symmetric. So we, we, if it's symmetric, you can, you can cancel it. So this thing doesn't contribute. Okay. So let's say it's symmetric. Then we basically have just, uh, no, sorry, th this never cancels. So this part cancels, but this part never cancels. So then we basically have to do, this is basically the ratio of e to the minus beta uh, beta e divided by e to minus beta e. Yeah. Then we say the, the, the following. If the energy is decreased when we try to make the step, then we always accept the step. So we always accept the step that has to, 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 total energy smaller than the previous step. Uh, but When the uh, when the energy is increased, then the probability to accept the step, the ratio is less than one. This ratio is less than one, and then we're going to accept it with finite probability. So, in other words, if the energy is increased, we're not going to reject the step. Okay. So, even though the energy is, even though this ratio becomes less than one, we are not going to reject the step. We are going to accept it with probability, which is less than one. However, if this ratio is bigger than one, which is what happens when the energy decreases, if the energy decreases, then this ratio is bigger than one, and then we just accept the step. So in other words, we always go downhill, but sometimes we even go up here when needed. So if we choose this ratio like that, then it's obvious that uh, the ratio between uh, the, this equation is also going to be satisfied, doesn't it? Because one of the two, either x to x prime or x prime to x, one of them will, uh, for, one of the, one, for one of the two, the ratio is going to be bigger than one, in which case we're going to take one. For one of the two, the ratio is going to be less than one, and then we take the entire ratio. OK, so therefore, the ratio of the two will always be that. OK, so it's obvious, isn't it? So this acceptance probability satisfies the balance condition. And therefore, according to theory, has to lead to desired mark or change with stationary probability configuration at long times. OK, so we understood now the Marco chain. OK, Marco chain is now completely understood. The Metropolis uh, uh, algorithm to uh to get marco chain so the idea is the following we uh we um the our transition probability is going to be composed of two parts one is going to be trial step probability which might be non-trivial and you might might be aware of it okay and the acceptance step probability for the trial step probability you have to make sure that this sum over all possible x primes is equal to one. This means that, this, that the space is 
connected. Okay, basically this sum or all possible x prime, but this after sufficient number of finite number of steps. So in other words, there is a way to uh, to get from x to x prime. There is always finite probability to going going from x to x prime after sufficient number of steps, after large number of steps. You should be able to go from x to x prime if you just do trial steps. Okay. So this is this is equivalent to saying that the that the that the, uh, that the space is connected. In other words, there, that we don't have a ergodicity problem. Okay, is, you remember this uh, condition at the very beginning uh, here, connectness. So I summarize, I, I emphasize here, connectness means that every configuration can be reached from any other configuration in finite number of steps. Doesn't it? That's that's an equivalent statement. And finally, once you know the trial step probability, you can also calculate the acceptance step probability in this way, which is that if the ratio uh, of this thing is more than one, you, uh, you take the trial step probability, to be, the acceptance step probability to be one. And if the ratio is less than one, then you take this, uh, then you, you accept the configuration with this probability, which is less than one. Okay. So this will always give you a detailed balance. And then finally, what you also need to understand is how to accept a step with probability which is less than one. If the probability is one, then you accept it. It's not obvious. But if the probability is less than one, then you accept it with some, with, with, sometimes you accept, sometimes you don't. So the, one, the way to accept is uh, we generate a random number between you know, zero and one and accept it with whenever this random number is less than the uh, probability to accept it. Isn't it? So that's the way to do it. Um, now, you have to keep in mind that uh, configurations that are generated in Markov chain are correlated. So the theory guarantees that we arrive at invariant distribution row after a long time. Two configurations are statistically independent only if they're far apart in Markov chain. The distance is called correlation time is usually very long. So that's that's actually very crucial. So um, the these uh, configurations are statistically dependent so therefore when you when you think of um, uh, error bar on your uh, on your simulation you should not treat uh, the two configurations in the marco chain as statistically independent okay and another thing which is kind of obvious but we always make a mistake or at least i do and probably many of you do is you, when you measure the distance in Markov chain, many times you need measure, you need uh, distance in Markov chain, then every step counts, even in, when you reject the step. This is still a step, isn't it? So if I accept the step, that's a step. If I reject the step, it's also a step. So every step is uh, meant to be a Marco, uh, a Marco step. Okay, so now, um, before we start simulating Ising model, I want to give you uh, one more non-trivial example of a trial step probability. Um, why? Because I mean, this is a concept which is somehow um, uh, usually is kind of um, uh, quickly skipped over, and you don't grasp the problem of trial step probability. For me, trial step probability is actually a non-trivial concept. And when you have a, a new problem, this is, uh, uh, how can I say, it can be quite non-trivial to, uh, to write it down. So therefore, it's good to train a little bit your mind about what this probabilities are. So I'm going to give you an example from Quantum Monte Carlo. So some of you which are non, not familiar with quantum systems, you might not understand it, and that's OK. Uh, don't worry. But those of you who are a bit more familiar with quantum um, uh, uh, systems, you will recognize these equations. Okay, but for understanding the concept, actually, you don't need quantum mechanics. Uh, but first, let me uh, introduce the problem. So, in quantum mechanics, we usually calculate the uh, observable. So, this a average A is observable uh, with the following equation. So this is one over z, which is z is partition function. So one over z, which, which is the partition function, times the integral or all possible states. So this is integral or all possible states of e to the minus s. So s is action. 
but you can think of it as Hamiltonian more or less with time, some time dependence in there. Well, action, actually, there's also a classical action. Uh, uh, so you can understand, even if you don't know quantum mechanics, you understand what action is uh, in Feynman sense. And then this is unobservable. Now, this size here are little strange things. They are called coherent states. So uh, if you have bosonic case, there are complex numbers. But if you have a Fermi, Fermi state, then it's the Grassmann numbers. But the, the important point is that we have some way of calculating an observable like that. And uh, this goes hand in hand with calculating partition functions. So whenever the observable is calculated in this way, then the partition function is calculated in that way. OK? A little complicated concept. Those of you who, understand, who know about quantum mechanics will probably recognize this immediately. Um, but if you don't, it's not a big, big problem. What I wanted to, the only thing that you need to uh, uh, keep in mind from all this discussion is that partition function eventually will be written in some way, in some way like that. Okay, why? Because this integration or all these complicated coherent states will have in quantum mechanics also the time integration. I mean, this in general doesn't need to be time, can also be space, but let, let me think of a time kind of easier uh, for, um, uh, for explaining. So this is gonna be integration over time. And here this W is gonna be some weight function, which, which eventually will give you Z. It's some function, can be anything, okay? It's can be a complicated thing, but let's say we have some, some function W and then some integration over possible times, okay? You can just think of this as my integration problem. You don't need to know much about quantum mechanics. Then I will explain this next time, of course, because we're already over time. Then you can simulate your problem with a certain interval. My configuration now is a configuration of times. Tau 1, tau 2, tau 3, tau 4, tau 5, which are distributed in my interval. I mean, it turns out that in quantum mechanics interval from zero to beta, but this generally is just from zero to cutoff, or whatever. Okay, in my inter interval, and then I, I, my configuration is basic configuration of random times, because I need to do an integ integral like that. I'm doing integral like that, and my configuration is configuration of random times, tau one, tau two, tau three, tau four, tau five, whatever, and I'm gonna move between configurations. So from this configuration to another configuration that has one more time or it has one less time. So in this, in this, if I go from here to here, I have configuration with one less time. If we go from here to here, I have configuration with one more time. And this is my step. Now, next time we're gonna discuss what is the trial step probability to go from that step to that step, to, to grow from that configuration to that configuration or the back. So you need, we need to figure out what's the trial step probability. We need to figure out what is acceptance step probability. And we need to figure out how to, how to um, calculate transition probability from the, from the two. And this is kind of non-trivial example. So to, to show you how um, this um, concepts of Monte Carlo can become quite non-trivial when you have a bit more complicated example. Okay. And, uh, we are, I think we are finished for today. I took you a few minutes extra, so a few minutes extra. I'm sorry. Uh, is there any urgent question? Any question from today's lecture? If not, then um, you can you can stay here and ask question after the time after the uh, lecture. Uh, 